Hey guys, you know Pro back again with another Let's Talk Duelist. Today I'm going to be doing something just a little bit different, and what I'm going to be talking about is a balanced philosophy that I believe Duelist has uh, used, and this is, you know, through the patch notes, through nerfs and busts of the cards, and you know, just the odd thing that developers have said. Now, I don't claim this to be the absolute truth. Um, this is coming from my opinion, not from the developers. So they may, you know, um, think of things in a completely different way, but I believe that using the same line of thinking that I'm talking about today, um, a similar kind of result with nerfs and buffs may have happened. So I'm going to break down this video into two parts because it's not um, as simple as, you know, do I balance in this one, because of this one reason or this other reason. There's lots and lots of different reasons, but the main ones are balancing based around factions and individual decks versus balancing around the power level of individual cards. And I think it's very clear um, based on some examples of how Duelist has chosen to do this in the past. Now first off, I just want to talk about balancing off as a faction. And I think a pretty general rule is that uh, overpowered or OP cards, as people will refer them, have been pretty consistently allowed to you know, run rampant as long as a faction or deck isn't you know, at the top of the meta, it's not dominating the play. Um, the game is built around being dynamic, very, very strong swing turns, very strong plays that has been toned down in the past, but powerful cards are a part of the game, and there's definitely cards that, you know, you look at them on paper, you think, how is this card allowed to exist? And, you know, maybe you go cry on the forums about it, but then you look at, a, you know, a meta snapshot, and suddenly, you know, maybe that faction or that deck is only third or fourth best faction. Um, suddenly, you can start to see why the developers are out. Now, in some circumstances, these cards may still be nerfed, and there's a bunch of reasons we will go over them afterwards. But as a general rule, as long as the card's not defining a metagame and just being way too overbearing, it tends to be al allowed as long, uh, even if it's overpowered, just because it's more about balancing factions, um, allowing multiple deck archetypes to be playable, rather than trying to make all cards of power level the same, um, which thankfully is a good thing. It makes more dynamic games, and if all cards were the same power level, things would get pretty boring pretty quickly. Um, you, you know, in it, a theoretical world where every card was perfectly balanced, it would probably be one of the most boring games. Your card choices wouldn't really matter in deck building. Um, you know, you wouldn't know what to play against. It would be kind of all over the place. So let's talk about some of the cards um, that have, you know, been considered overpowered by some members of the community, basically for a very long time, um, that haven't really, you know, gotten nerfs or any attention from the devs. And I think there's a lot of reasoning behind this. So stuff like Vorpal Reaver, Spectral Revenant, um, from Abyssian, very, very strong late game minions that are definitely starting to see more play now that Abyssian is more viable. But Abyssian hasn't been at the top of the metagame, at least not consistently for a very, very long time. So these cards haven't been touched, and neither has a lot of Abyssian. Just that small Reaper of the Nine Moons uh, nerf a few patches back. Um, but that was also you know about randomness, but we're not going to talk about that now. Now, some that are more familiar that have definitely um, received a lot more scrutiny from the, from the community. This one, not so much, but Mechantor War Beast is a card um, that is definitely above the power level of the average card included in most meta decks. A 4-4 with Rush for 6 mana, um, it's a bit understated, but with that Frenzy ability, it makes it so, so strong. Most of the time, I'm going to be clearing off at least one minion, doing 4 damage to the general, um, and still leaving a body over, plus the potential to do more, it can be buffed. Um, you know, it's like a Holy Immolation on a stick, basically. You don't have to worry about having your own 2-drop. Um, it can be buffed by just buffing the attack. Very, very strong card, um, and basically a 3-of in all Magma decks. Now, is having a card that's a 3-of um, in all decks necessarily a problem? Well, at times it can be, but you know the devs have chosen to accept that there are these powerful cards. People will learn to play around them. There are counters to Mechantor, playing in diagonal lines, playing a minion, and then moving two spaces away from it. As long as the interaction is healthy, this card has counterplay, um, and you can work around it, then it's fine for these cards to be auto-included. They're not brainless, they require decision-making, um, and create you know, strong turns. Another one is a very similar effect in Holy Immolation. Now, this is a card I've probably seen cried about even more than Mechantor. I, I shouldn't say cried, because these are valid complaints. When looking at these cards in a vacuum, they are very, very powerful. They're above the level of other cards. Um, but it's more about balancing as a faction. And as long as they're interactive, I think the devs want these kinds of cards in the game, just because um, the game should be back and forth. 
Back when we saw the two card draw, it was basically constant swings turns, clear minions, play your own minions, constantly, not one person pushing the tempo all the time. That has definitely slowed down and early advantages can kind of continue a little bit more. But these strong swing turns are still a part of Duelist and cards like Holy Immolation allow that kind of thing. Now, we can look at Holy Immolation and say it's a very, very strong card. But when we look at Lioner, is anyone really calling for nerfs to Lioner? Probably the people who are calling for nerfs to Lioner are those uh, with smaller card collections playing in the lower ranks where the basic uh, Lioner cards are actually very strong. But looking at it from a competitive point of view, Lioner is not dominating the meta. Yes, it's very, very strong, but I don't think um, most people will be calling for nerfs to Lioner. So that's why Holy Immolation is allowed to exist. Now, following on with this Lioner example, we switch to a card... Um, Possibly even a little bit more controversial, just because of how broken it can seem um, when it goes off, and that is Divine Bond. Now, what's particularly interesting about this card? Uh, this card was already, you know, complained about and called for for nerfs, you know, for quite a while. Um, it wasn't overbearing on the meta. It wasn't always a three-off. But then the devs actually chose to buff this card um, after the big change, I believe, with the card draw system, and they lowered the cost from three mana to two mana. Now, why would they do this? The card was objectively already pretty powerful, but what this card does is it helps to balance and get Lionar to a healthy level um, of strength within the meta. Now, it's very, very powerful. The potential to give up to 10 attack um, or more for just two mana is definitely way above some other cards. But what this allows, it allows Lionar to have an effective finisher at closing out the game. Suddenly you take away Divine Bond, Sure, Liner has these big high HP minions, but they're not closing out the game fast at all. Your opponent can often just ignore these Iron Cliffs now, and they can only take 3 damage a turn, which is really not a high clock. As we can see from the meta, Liner is, you know, definitely a strong faction, but it's not overbearing, so we can imply that, you know, they're balanced around having this really strong finisher. Now, if you're calling for a nerf to this card, then I think you definitely need to be calling to buffs to other aspects of Liner, whether that be a replacement finisher or giving them tools to play a more grindy game um, where they take that you know board advantage with these high HP minions and they're able to turn it into a win some other way. But definitely taking away a Divine Bond that actually puts pressure on the opponent and puts a clock on the opponent could be very risky in taking it away. And it's not just a matter of just taking away a card from the most OP faction if that you know card is the, the core piece of a deck. It's very risky. We don't want to delete decks. We never really want to you know, eliminate a faction from the meta, which thankfully the devs haven't really done. It's definitely important to keep in mind. We have to kind of assume that the devs know what they're doing, and I think they've proved themselves to be very effective devs. They communicate very well, um, and the game has you know, been pretty decently balanced for the most part. There's been a few iffy patches, um, but now we're definitely coming into a tough, um, you know, a pretty balanced meta where a lot of decks are viable. What this means when we're calling for nerfs is that if we absolutely destroy cards, say we make Divine Bond 4 or 5 mana, which I have seen this suggestion, um, then, you know, and then if Lionar is still a good deck, we have to really question, you know, how was Lionar not absolutely dominating everything? And we can take that assumption and kind of assume that, you know, we can't destroy these core cards of the deck and have a balanced faction still. Alright, so that's enough about Divine Bond. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit more about the factions and that nerfs and buffs will not just serve to lower or increase power levels, but to make sure that the play style um, that a faction or a deck has is what the developers would consider healthy. Now, in a general case, this tends to be stuff like um, interaction on the board, playing for board control, um, not just playing a bunch of out of hand damage, um, especially spell based damage. Definitely minion based rush damage has definitely been a, a little bit more allowed. We haven't really seen a lot of the nerfs to that apart from Tusk War, which is a whole other matter altogether. Um, definitely a lot of the rush cards are still in the game and obviously the developers consider them a little bit more interactive. There's Provoke, um, there's simply running away and creating distance, whereas spell based damage we have seen nerfs, um, but we will talk about that a little bit later. So it's not just about power level, it is about ensuring that a playstyle um, matches what the devs see as healthy for the game. We currently don't really see any decks um, such as Freeze Mage in Hearthstone. Very uninteractive, doesn't play for board control whatsoever. Um, just playing winning for spells. The devs have really kind of stayed away from that approach, and we see very few uh, combo decks um, to that extent, at the very least. And those that we do see are not really viable competitively. And it's also important to keep note is that once again coming back to this faction balance 
balance between two factions rather than individual cards, um, it is okay for the cards to you know be uh, you know, strictly better than another card because of the difference in faction. When it's a neutral card and you know some cards are strictly better than others, sometimes that gets a little bit iffy. Um, some would call it power creep. But if we compare Staff of Ikea, a Vitruvian 2-mana artifact that gives a general to attack, and then we compare it with Abyssian's 2-mana artifact, uh, Spectral Blade, we see that Spectral Blade is strictly better. It has that to attack, but it also um, has an additional healing effect. Now, Spectral Blade's played a fair bit um, in most Abyssian decks, and Staff of Ikea's not really played, but there's definitely solid reasoning behind this. And first, you know, the first big indicator that suggests this is not a problem is that, well, you know, Abyssinian is not better than Vitruvian. Why would we nerf this Spectral Blade card just because it's strictly better? Going into more detail, it's also got to consider the dynamic of the faction. Vitruvian is the artifact faction, and, you know, it was Songhai for a little bit because of just Mask of Shadows, but now that's gone. Um, Vitruvian is the artifact faction. It doesn't really see a lot of play, um, but it's balanced around a two mana Staff of Yakir, um, is a lot better than. You know, just a spectral blade without any artifact synergy if you have that artifact support with the staff of your kill. So we need to keep in mind that the factions are balanced as a whole. We're not looking at one card and saying this is way better than this other card in this faction. Um, we're looking at it from a whole perspective. Now that is enough of balancing as a faction. I think it's a pretty clear concept. It's about balancing the top decks with each other and making sure all archetypes are represented, all factions are represented, and they all have a viable s rank deck. And I think we're in a pretty good situation in that I do believe probably all generals are definitely s rank viable. Um, even Sarge, who has the worst Bloodborne spell, just by nature of being a Vitruvian, is probably good enough to get to s rank now. Um, and definitely, you know, the better players will be able to have some success with it still. Okay, so now we're talking about balance of individual cards. And this is, you know, a little bit different. It's not necessarily just because a, um, a deck is on top tier, but that has basically historically been the way it's gone. So the first, you know, target for nerfs are cards that are clearly defining the meta. They're warping the metagame around them. It's have an answer to this card, be able to beat this card, um, or, you know, go under decks that are playing this card. This has been stuff like uh, Old Third Wish, Old Tusk War, very, very strong cards, auto includes, um, and defining a very aggressive metagame, or, you know, a dispel heavy metagame, really shaping that all decks need an answer to these really, really powerful cards. But it's not always just about lowering the power level. Sometimes a very strong card can exist, and that's fine. The developers are happy with that, but they're not happy um, with the playstyle that this card promotes. Now, what I am talking about here is the prime example of this um, was Old Lantern Fox. Now, Old Lantern Fox basically, uh, for those who went around, created massive, massive burst combos. With Land Fox, you were able to inner focus it out of hand. Um, with that Celery, give it a bunch of buff spells, and all that damage from that buff spells, Saber Spines, Killing Edges, um, will be doubled when the Land Fox attacks. So the devs thought this was way too much out of hand damage, easily, you know, doing 18 a lot of the time. So they needed to, they decided to nerf it. But in the end, it's not strictly a nerf. Now, Lantern Fox was very, very strong, and you could probably say it is a nerf, but the card that they replaced it with is still one of the strongest cards in the game. So, what this tells us is the devs don't necessarily mind the power level of a card when they're nerfing it. It may be, you know, the second best deck, but they may still choose to nerf it if a card is promoting um, a playstyle they don't like. In the case of Old Lantern Fox, this was a bunch of out-of-hand damage, um, needing to have an immediate answer or losing the game. Lantern Fox is currently very strong, but what we do notice out of it is one, um, it's not as good for out of hand damage. You know, sure you can in a focus it, but that's only doing five damage if you also cast the Phoenix Fire. Two in the focuses, um, that's ten damage. It's really not. It's nothing insane. That's not why you play this card. Why you play this card is to generate value, um, and also you know put your opponent on a little bit more pressure. But it gives your opponent the chance to react to the card. Sure, if it gets inner focus, has one guaranteed Phoenix Fire, but you still have a chance to dispel the remaining body. Um, you know, you have the option to deal four damage to it, and you know, make sure it only gets one Phoenix Fire. There's plenty of ways that you can play around this card, and it's promoted a much more interactive style. Allows Songhai to play slightly more of a value-oriented game because now they have a minion that generates um, ongoing value. All these kind of things about changing the play style. Now, there has definitely been a significant tendency. Um, as I was saying, to nerf these uninteractive cards that promote out-of-hand burst. Now, the prime example of this was the nerf 
to Spiral Technique. Now, Spiral Technique is still a pretty good card, but when it was 7 mana, it was definitely a very core cool part of any Soulhound deck's gameplay. Basically, your opponent's general is starting at 17 health. First few turns, you try and get them down as much damage as you can, then turn 7 comes along, and you know, you just gotta hit them for 8 damage, and that'll often finish off the game. So, the devs decided they don't want this kind of um, uninteractive playstyle. Damage out of hand um, with spells is very, very hard to avoid in this game, and it basically you know, made healing a lot more important. So, this card was interact. It's not a card um, that can be played around too easy. Now, obviously, you can play around with healing and you know, avoiding taking damage, um, but once you add a health, if you don't have heal, there's basically nothing you can do. So, that's why this card is in a It wasn't necessarily too high a power level. There was you know, stronger cards in the deck. There was Tusk Bores, Mask of the Shadows, and this card didn't receive a nerf for a very long time, and it's definitely a playstyle, um, you know, reasoning rather than a strictly power level. There's also cards that are just a little bit too strong, um, and those will just always be nerfed. Now, I don't think any of the ones I've talked about so far have been at that level um, that are currently in the game, such as, you know, the Holy Immolations and Mechantors. They don't define the metagame. They just, you know, are very very strong staple in the decks that they're in. Now, there was a couple of cards um, that I saw people have been you know, calling for nerfs for, and the new patch has just come out today, and none of these cards were nerfed. There was no real balance changes at all. So let's take a look at some of these cards um, and why they may or may not have been nerfed, um, and why the developers may have done this. Okay, so Black Solace um, is a card that I've seen a lot of people calling for as a nerf. Now, Black Solace was in the game for a very long time, and it was basically, you know, not played at all. But along comes Lilith's new Bloodborne spell, and suddenly this card is very, very strong. The ability to summon two Wraithlings very reliably for one mana um, makes this, you know, a 5 mana 8, uh, 11, a large majority of the time, that can grow even bigger. Now, this is coming back a little bit to the balance of factions, talking about that earlier. Um, Abyssin is not dominating the metagame, is there really a need to nerf um, Abyssian and take one of its key core cards away? And suddenly now it's back at the bottom of the of the meta. So if you wanted to nerf this card, then you know suddenly um, you have to buff a bunch of other Abyssian cards and replace this power level, um, of what's making up a decent amount of the power level of Abyssian. Now there is definitely a difference between nerfing this and a card like Spiral Technique. Even if we say they were on the same power level, Black Solace definitely has a lot more counterplay that encourages, you know, fighting for board control. Um, and 811 isn't going to win the game by itself. It takes a whole turn to do anything. Um, and it encourages board control by being able to take that time to keep on growing, developing more Wraith Links. So it's definitely already, we can see it's a bit of a healthier play style. And also, you know, you know this is one of the bigger threats in the Abyssian deck. Um, you need to plan around it. Something like a you know, a repulsive beast is very good against this card, saving your hard removal, balancing it out, um, and that also creates interesting decisions. If you suddenly have one removal, uh, do you risk saving it for the Vorp Reaver that you might not be able to deal with, or do you just, you know, try and tempo out and remove the Black Souls and then play something else? So it's definitely more interactive, and because this card plays to the board, um, we can definitely see why it's more allowed. It's not defining the metagame, um, it has a healthy ish at least play style, I think that's fair to say. So this card has been allowed to continue on, at least for the time being. Another one um, is Second Wish. So Second Wish was changed pretty recently, so now it gives 2-2 to a friendly minion, and the enemy general can't damage it. Now, is this card interactive? Well, I would say it's pretty interactive. Sure, it does work with Rush minions, which slightly gets, you know, slightly less interactive, but we can still expect Saber Spine in a lot of Atrivia decks. You can start to plan around it before it comes out. You can have 4 damage removal already. You can have a Provoke on your General to stop that ability coming in. Um, there's lots of different things you can do. And then, you know, it also rewards board control. That is a massive part of this card. If you are just simply relying on Saber Spine Tiger for this card ever to get activated, um, you know, you're basically stuffed. But if you have board control throughout the game, um, suddenly these small minions that you might you know, get a little bit more value out of um, are a real threat and it encourages board control. So it's not too bad. Um, obviously, it, you know, increasing out of hand damage is never a great thing, but I think this card is definitely fine for the time being. Um, and we won't see any nerfs out of because of playstyle reasons, but more because of power level reasons if a nerf does come in. Okay, so that's basically it. I just want to really reiterate that you know these are just my opinions trying to 
gauge um, you know the mentality of the devs. But I do believe it's more about you know balancing factions as a whole and ensuring a healthy playstyle, which I feel most decks in duelists do have. There's not really a ton of out of hand damage apart from Vitruvian, um, but at least most of that damage does come through the board. And damage coming through the board through minions is inherently a lot more interactive. You can run away from them, you can provoke them, you can clear their board. Um, lots and lots of different ways to play around it, where spell damage and, you know, these really big burst combos from hand are a lot harder to play around. So less about uh, balancing individual cards and more about balancing as a faction, as a deck. And I think we're in a pretty decent spot. There's definitely some generals that are a lot weaker than others, but basically every faction is playable um, at competitive levels. I, I would really struggle to make a tier list with the bottom, just because you know this, these general abilities have really diversified. I'd probably say Songhai and then maybe Magma. Um, you could possibly even switch them around, but it's pretty close with Vitruvian being the, probably the clear winner. Anyway guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, do you think the devs should take a more aggressive approach to balancing? Do you think the game is in balance at the moment? Um, and do you think there should be you know, a lowering of the overall overpowered cards? Or do you enjoy the more dynamic gameplay that each faction having these really strong cards creates? If you want to see more of these, uh, make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.